Plato's Cave is produced by Muckraker Media. You can find out more at muckrakermedia.org. So with me today, I have Dr. David Papineau. David is a professor at, of philosophy at King's College London and at the, at the City University of New York Graduate Center. He is the author of nine books, including Philosophical Naturalism, Thinking About Consciousness, and Knowing the Score. So David, uh, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me here. So um, just out of curiosity to start, what, what is it like um, being at two different universities, obviously in, in two different countries as well? I've been doing it for about six years, and okay. it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, the, mm. the teaching is not that different. Uh, mm. The students are very similar, same philosophical tradition. Mm. Uh, in New York, it's the graduate center, so it's only... PhD students and master's students and mm. all the teaching is graduate seminars and that's that sort of fun it's kind of challenging I mean uh, smart students uh, other faculty come and sit in on the class so that's a different kind of teaching than teaching undergraduates but it's it's a nice change I quite like the the variation hmm and so do you do uh, I'm assuming one semester at one school one semester at the other or how, how's the breakdown there exactly so, so I, okay. I, I I do the, the, the fall the fall in the UK and the spring spring in New York. Okay. That does sound nice actually. A good change of pace, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Though, though it remains to be seen how it's gonna go with uh, COVID oh. and so on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I'm not planning to be in New York next next spring. Uh, there's all yeah. kinds of budget yeah. problems, visa problems, uh, and <laughs> actual virus problems. So Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, New York is probably one of the last places I would choose to be right now if uh, things well, don't improve. I think that's a mistake. I think that's a mistake. I, I, I would think in the States, New York mm. is one of the safest places right now. I mean, the, num the numbers are low. They're not going up. Uh, that's true, actually. Yeah. 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 No, you're. I think, actually, yeah, you're right. I, that statement was more true uh, maybe three months ago or something. But now you're, you're probably right. Um, so we have uh, a bigger fish to fry, though. Um, so you uh, are, are hopefully going to help me understand uh, your position on uh, consciousness. And, um, and this has been sort of something that I've been diving into recently. Actually, the, um, the episode right before this one uh, will be released with uh, Bernardo Kastrup, um, who we, we spoke about this same, same uh, topic. And he comes at it from a very different uh, perspective than you, I think. And... Um, and so I'm interested to kind of, after, you know, having that conversation, hear your thoughts. So just to start, if you could tell, tell everyone um, what exactly we're talking about when, when we say consciousness. <laughs> That's uh, maybe a bit difficult, right? So uh, <laughs> there's the, the famous, uh, consciousness is, 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 it feels like something. It's like something for you. And uh, uh, I can't remember which philosopher's, Quoted Louis Armstrong, but I mean, he said about somebody asked him what is jazz. He said, "Well, if you've got to ask, you're never going to know." And uh, <laughs> and uh, the philosopher said about consciousness: if you don't understand what it is for it to be like something for you, for you to have kind of conscious feelings, well, if you don't understand that, you're never going to know. But it's easy enough to illustrate it. I mean, take the difference. I mean, here I am looking at the screen. I can look outside the, the window and I'm visually conscious. And if I close my eyes, that aspect of my consciousness goes away. It ceases to be visually like something for me. Mm. Or if you're asleep, in fact, sleep is not such a good example. I don't know if you've had a general anesthetic recently. If you have a general anesthetic, when you wake up, it's kind of weird. And it's not necessarily weird because you, where am I? You, you know perfectly well, you've woken up for dinner. I say, what's weird is that for the last two or three hours, nothing has been happening. Mm. Very different from falling asleep. When you're asleep, you're actually still, dreams are conscious. It's like something to have dreams. You're hearing noises, you're turning over. You're quite conscious when you're asleep. But when you have a general anesthetic, it all goes away. So that's what consciousness is. It's your kind of uh, awareness. Uh, uh, and it's the means by which you know what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I guess um, I, I tried to explain it. Um, I had an online correspondence with someone, and I tried to put it in terms of consciousness is maybe, you know, we could defini defini definitionally put it as, you know, the 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 quality of having different experiences irrespective of what those experiences are like you know so um the fact that i'm kind of feeling a bit of cool air from the air conditioner next to me but you know i can also feel kind of you know pressure on my seat all of those are maybe we could call different you know different experiences but consciousness is the condition of having experience at all would you agree with that definition yeah so okay. I mean, there's there's different ways of defining consciousness. You can say, you know, yeah, you know, are are fish conscious? Are computers conscious? And then then you're not asking what experiences they have, but mm -hmm. are they the kind of creature who has consciousness? And yes. We sometimes talk about creature consciousness. I mean, are fish conscious? Uh, but I think the most more basic idea is the idea of specific conscious experiences, specific episodes of consciousness, as when you feel a pain, you hear the air conditioner, the air feels cooler or whatever. Those are specific conscious experiences. And I think we define creature consciousness in terms of that rather than the other way around. I mean, a creature is consciousness if it's the kind of creature that can have conscious experiences. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, and yeah, I so I, I guess another way to put it is um, Thomas Nagel's, you know, famous phrase, which you, are, you already used. Um, what is it like to be something? And to illustrate this for listeners, you know, presumably, um, you know, if I the example that Nagel uses is a bat. So if I were to trade places with a bat, that would be synonymous, not with, you know, kind of the lights turning off, as you said, with general anesthesia, but it would be just a very different experience. So the quality of my experience would be radically different. You know, I would sort of see in scare quotes with sonar um, as opposed to vision and and I would have wings instead of arms. And, you know, the details of the the experiences would all be different. But uh, presumably, and we can get into this, but it would be not synonymous with sort of um, death or or general anesthesia no sure i mean so but that's just to say mm -hmm. that that's a conscious sure which, sure which uh is not so i mean i i, I think they are I, they, but but mm -hmm. is, is, is concerned to argue from that premise uh not not to argue for that premise he takes it as pretty obvious yes yes that that's a quite sophisticated uh uh, mammals on the level of mice or rats or foxes, and uh, surely they're conscious, so that's a conscious too. Uh, Nagel is more interested in the fact that uh, there's a sense in which we don't know what it's like to be a bat. You said you'd kind of see mm. sonar, but what <laughs> like is is that like seeing things like we see them, or is it like kind of hearing somehow because they're doing it via sonar? And Nagel's mm is that we really don't have very much idea of how it is for the bat. Even though it's taking it, there really is something that it's like for the bat. So he's trying mm -hmm. to highlight the existence of this phenomenon of consciousness by pointing out that in the bat case, it's there, but it's something we don't know about. Mm -hmm. And it's, it really is a deeply strange question when you put it that way. Um, you know, to, to understand what it actually would be like to be a bat. Well, um, so, so, but Nagel's real point is that even after you know everything there is to know about hmm. the workings of a bat from a scientific point of view, you might be an expert on bat physiology and echolocation and the computational theory of bat uh, navigation and so on. And Nagel says, you still won't know what it's like to be a bat. Mm. And the, the kind of conclusion he's trying to edge towards there is that your being conscious, whether you're a human being or a bat, mm. is something extra to the way you are physically. And he tries to drive that point home. He doesn't make the, this argument quite explicit in that paper. It's made more explicit in Frank Jackson's famous Mary argument. But the point he's trying to drive home 
is that even if you know everything there is about the bat from a physical point of view, you still won't know what it's like for the bat. And the conclusion he's trying to get is that therefore bat consciousness is different from bat physiology. Mm -hmm. And I guess I take it from everything you said that that you would disagree as as I do with um, with people like maybe Daniel Dennett or Michael Graziano, where they say that, you know, we're, we're kind of mistaken to even be talking about this, that consciousness itself is an illusion. You wouldn't agree with that, right? No, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to a lot of the things that they argue on the way to that conclusion, but I see no reason to put it like that. It sounds silly. It does, it, yeah. Is it an illusion? I mean, why do you want to put it like that? I mean, I want to say that Nagel is wrong to think there's anything more to bat consciousness than bat physiology. I think the bat's being conscious is just the same as... Mm the bat having a certain physiology and doing certain computations in its brain. And what Nagel is pointing to is not that the consciousness is something extra, but just that we can't have bat consciousness in the way that bats do because we're not bats. Um, mm. We don't have bat brains. If we had bat brains, then we'd have bat consciousness. But we don't have bat brains, so we don't have bat consciousness. And because we don't have bat brains, we can't really recreate bat experiences using our brains. So I'm with Nagel and uh, many other scientists, philosophers in this area, in, I mean with Dennett and many other scientists, philosophers in this area, in saying there isn't anything more to consciousness than the brain. But I don't want to then say, and therefore there's no consciousness, because mm. that seems silly. I mean, what I want to say is that conscious experiences just are brain processes. Now, the difference between me and Dennett is not a big one. Dennett, the real difference is that Dennett thinks that everyday thinking about consciousness already presupposes that consciousness is non-physical. And therefore, in that sense of something non-physical, he denies there's any such thing. He doesn't think there is anything non-physical. So he ends up saying there's no consciousness. Consciousness is an illusion. The idea of something non-physical is an illusion. But I'm perfectly happy to say the everyday idea of something being conscious doesn't really rule out its being a physical process. There was nothing in what we said at the beginning about what it's like and what goes on when you're and this, this anesthetized and what, when you're not to imply that what's going on when you're not anesthetized is non-physical. And if so, if all we mean by being conscious is what's going on when you're not anesthetized, now, yeah, sure, we're conscious, but there's nothing going on except what's physical. That's my position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I definitely agree with you that you don't have to deny, uh, you know, the existence of consciousness in order to deny the hard problem. Those are two separable things. You don't have to, um, to deny one in order to deny the other. Right? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> no, I, I, had, I had a little... Twitter debate with Philip Goff recently about... Oh, okay. no, He's this, actually scheduled to come this, on this, later this year. This is a techie issue about uh, exactly what is the hard problem supposed to be. Hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> I and wanted to ask you about that. I, I'd always thought the hard problem was just supposed to be what is consciousness? Uh, uh, what does our term consciousness refer to in reality? So I was perfectly happy to accept there was a hard problem, but conclude that the answer is it refers to various physical processes that are like something when you have them. But he convinced me that the statement of the hard problem builds in some anti-physicalist presuppositions that I don't accept. So if he's right about what the hard problem is, and this is a slightly techie issue about exactly what did Dave Chalmers define the hard problem, to find the hard problem as. If he's right about what the hard problem is, I think I deny there's a hard problem, exactly, the way you put it uh, uh, two minutes ago. Sure. So, so I think, I, I think yeah. there's consciousness, but let's put it like this. I don't think there's a hard problem of consciousness. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Because I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to kind of gr get straight what exactly Chalmers did mean by that. Um, because I, I read the, actually the first line of your, um, piece in AIA, I think it was earlier this year, it was from March. Um, I don't have the piece in front of me. Um, 
but I, I think it was from maybe March or it was in the earlier spring of this year. Um, but I, I, I guess so. You're so just for listeners. Um, so your opening line in that is um, quote. I've never viewed the so-called hard problem as any problem at all. According to David Chalmers, who coined the term, the hard problem is supposed to be the problem of figuring out what our idea of consciousness refers to in the real world. The obvious answer to th- is the obvious answer is that refers to brain processes that feel like something. What's so hard about that? Unquote. And I guess that's 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 the thing that Philip got took exception to. OK, anyway, so we'll, we'll sure. come back to that. Ask, ask what you were going to ask about that. Yeah, so I was going to say, maybe, maybe you've so you've maybe changed your mind since then. But I was going to say, I I didn't really read that as the hard problem that Chalmers was getting at, um, because he says, you know, for for listeners, there's the easy problems of consciousness, and then there's the hard problems. And this is in his paper, facing up to the problem of consciousness. He says the easy problems of consciousness are those that seem directly susceptible to the standard methods of cognitive science. Um, so these are able to be reduced into scientifically, you know, reductionist terms. So these are, you know, uh, terms of, of function, you know, the reportability of mental states, the ability to discriminate, categorize and react to environmental stimuli, you know, understanding the differences between wakefulness and sleep, stuff that we've gone over. But he says that the hard problem, um, he says, quote, uh, the really hard problem of consciousness is the problem of experience. Uh, the question of how it is that these systems are subjects of experience is perplexing. Why is it that when cognitive systems engage in visual and auditory information processing, we have visual and auditory experience? So I take that as him sort of, I don't know if the zombie argument or the zombie problem came before or after him, but it seems like he's sort of tabling that problem of saying, you know, the really hard problem is why why experience needs to come along for the ride, basically. Why couldn't we have all of these functions without when, when, any when experience? You're, yeah. When you're asking that, mm-hmm. why does experience come along from the ride? Mm-hmm. You're presupposing, I would say, mm-hmm. that the physical processes are one thing and the conscious experiences are something extra. You're presupposing that it's possible we have a being who had all the physical stuff and not the experiences. And so you're already presupposing there's two things there. Uh, let me give you an analogy. Suppose, suppose somebody said, I don't understand why you know, Tony Curtis is there whenever Bernie Schwartz is there. <laughs> and, and I say, no, no, look, I mean, in my view, they're just, there's one person. Come on, there's just one person. And you say, I, I don't quite understand. So you're saying that every time Bernie Schwartz is there, Tony Curtis comes along for the ride? I said, no, no, you're mis- you put it like that, you're presupposing there's two people. You're presupposing they could come apart. And then you're wondering why they go together. But if there's only one person, there isn't any question of why do they not come apart. Uh, they couldn't come apart. There's just one person. And I think, you know, having a pain and having your C5 is firing is just the same thing. There's no... There's no possibility of one without the other. Now, when you said it, you said, why does visual experience come along for the ride? Mm -hmm. That's presupposing they're two different things. The quotes you read out from Dave Chalmers there did not yet presuppose that. It just said, why is there visual experience? Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Explain why there's visual experience. Well, one, one answer is just, well, visual experience just is certain activities in the visual cortex, nothing more. So why there's visual experience is why it's, it's because there's certain activities in the visual cortex. The exchange I had with Philip Goff after I published that article, he pointed to other passages than the one you quoted in that paper, mm-hmm. where clearly Chalmers is setting up the hard problem on the assumption that zombies are possible, that experience is something separate from uh, brain processes. And if that's what's presupposed by the hard problem, I reject the presupposition. I deny there's a hard problem. If the hard problem is just why is there visual experience in me now, I don't reject that question. But I think it's a perfectly sufficient answer to say there's certain activities in my visual cortex. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. what experiences are. Okay. So I, I guess then... 
so are you denying the the sort of conceivability of a, of a zombie where you know you can have the same mechanisms um you know physical mechanisms but but not have any experience then you're saying that just in this world in this universe that's just not even possible right so th- one has to be careful here okay. i don't deny the conceivability of a zombie okay. i don't deny the conceivability of bernie schwartz uh not being in the same place as tony curtis imagine somebody who grew up with bernie schwartz he, he'd seen the movies with tony curtis he no, he looked very different when he's a kid. He hadn't put the two things together. That guy will not just conceive that Tony Curtis and Bernie Schwartz are in different places. He'll believe they're in different places. It's perfectly conceivable that they come apart. Mm-hmm. But what he's conceiving is not, in fact, possible. Okay. Okay. Also, for Tony Curtis to be somewhere Bernie Schwartz isn't. There's just the same person, right? Mm-hmm. So I think we have two different ways of thinking. So if I say, look, there's a certain... I have the experience of seeing something red, and and now look, there's somebody who's got a certain activity phi and V4 in their visual cortex. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are certainly two different names, and you can conceive, uh, you, know, you might not know, it's a matter of scientific discovery that seeing mm. something red is the same as phi and V4. So it's conceivable. Uh, the, the scientists, you know, they haven't done the experiments yet. They can see fine V4. They know about PC red. Uh, yeah. is, 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 are they the same thing? Maybe they're not. Maybe that's seeing green. So they're conceiving that it's not the case. But in fact, it is the case that those are the same thing, seeing red and that activity in V4. And mm. uh, so zombies are conceivable, but they're not possible. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. No, I, I, that makes sense to me. Um, so I guess yeah, you're you're admitting that they are conceivable, but then the conceivability just it doesn't it doesn't move any intuitions for you. Basically, it's what's possible that matters, not not what's conceivable. Look, after after I discovered that Tony Curtis was Bernie Schwartz, mm-hmm. I mean, an ignorant person, or I mean, somebody who's positively in error, they can conceive or believe that they're not the same person. But now I've discovered that they are the same person. And now you ask me, well, now imagine that uh, Bernie's in the room, but Tony's not. And I'll say, hang on, what are you asking me to imagine, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's only one person. What am I supposed to be imagining? I mean, we can cook up some story about imagining different films. Mm -hmm. It's the same or something. But but once you you know they're the same thing, it's not a matter of intuition, really. It's a matter of... uh, there's no room left in my space of possibilities for the two mm. things to come apart. Uh, okay, so that's my that's what we ought to think about consciousness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I guess I I so conceptually for me may, maybe I do believe that the experience of something and then the physical. Um, you know, causation or correlation of it are two separate things. Um, I'm sure you. I, I guess I must, and and I'm curious why you don't believe that. Because I guess you know, if we, um, you know, if you experience something, uh, undoubtedly, you know, you know, every time I experience, you know, heat on my hand, I put my hand above a hot stove or something, right? That, that undoubtedly every time is going to be caused by some physical, you know, mechanisms. Um, but you could but, think that they're different things, and then you're on the other side from me. I mean, uh, yeah, you can think that there's, there's a perfectly close correlation mm-hmm. between the signals coming in your arm, certain uh, nociceptive or specific neurons in your brain firing off, and that you'll feel a pain when and only when you have that neural activity, but you can still think that they're separate things. One is the is the neural activity, and then there's this extra thing, which mm-hmm. which in principle, think of zombies, doesn't have to be there. Uh, and you're thinking mm-hmm. of them two different things, even if they're perfectly correlated in the natural world. And mm-hmm. when I said, I'm sure you think like that, <laughs> I wasn't being rude. Okay, now draw a line on everything I've said. I'm not going to say something I haven't said before. Okay. 
I think it's very, very intuitively compelling to think of them as separate things. I think that nearly everybody finds themselves thinking in dualistic terms, even, even me. I have to kind of force myself to think, look, there's only one person, there. there's only one process, it's the same process, they couldn't come apart. It's, look, when somebody asks you to imagine, so, so right, we do, we do the science, we discover there's, you know, experiences of red only when there's that activity in V4, uh, pains when and only when there's a neuronal activity, and and now somebody says, okay, now now imagine a zombie being as physically just like you sure. and doesn't have those feelings. If we were identity theorists, as I am, mm -hmm. we ought to react identity theorists by saying, I don't get it. What do you suppose? It's like. Imagine sure. Tony's in the room and not Tony. What am I supposed to imagine? They're the same person. <laughs> They're the same thing. And somebody asks you to imagine a being who has that thing and doesn't have it. You'll say, what am I supposed to imagine? The fact that we all think, oh, yeah, zombies, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. To the extent you think zombies make sense, you're already thinking of the pains and the neural activity as different things. If you think mm -hmm. zombies make sense, after all the scientific evidence, you're still thinking of different things. So you ask me, why am I resistant to this absolutely natural and indeed compelling thought? And <laughs> that's because of a quite different argument that we haven't, we haven't even started mentioning yet. And the argument is, and it's a very strong argument, and it moves nearly all philosophers in this area, including David Chalmers. Mm -hmm. The argument is, that if the pains and the visual experiences and so on are something different from the brain processes, then it looks as if they can't have any physical effects in the physical world. And that mm. looks crazy. So the problem is that, that once you do modern science, you think that all the movements of my limbs and things I say and so on are produced by nerve signals coming down from my brain and activity in the motor cortex and that's produced by activity in the prefrontal cortex and we think we can we can trace a chain of causation back at the physiological level without ever leaving the physiological level and mm. if I mean, we can make this more formal but but you can see that line of thought pushes to the conclusion that if the feelings are something separate from the brain processes then they're going to be epiphenomenal they're going to be kind of dangling off, not doing any work. I mean, mm -hmm. that, they're going to be like, here's a train going along, which is all the causation in your brain, and here's the puffs of smoke going up, which are kind of produced by the brain, these mm -hmm. things, but don't themselves have any influence on the motion of the train. They don't themselves have any influence on, on your physical activity. Mm -hmm. And that ends up being a very ugly position, epiphenomenalism, that, that we have these conscious feelings that are produced by the brain, but don't themselves have any effects in the physical world. I mean, it's, hmm. a, it's a strange metaphysical picture. It's, it's deeply disturbing of our view of ourselves. All our conscious thoughts and feelings aren't making any difference to what we do. That's all. It's like, you know, it's like a little kid who's got a toy <laughs> and kind of copies their their parent and uh, they think they're driving the car but in fact i mean their movements are having no influence on the direction of the car and mm. so if you found this is a really horrible position uh, and so if you want to think that your conscious mental events have an influence on your bodily movements and on the physical world beyond mm -hmm. then you'd better push those conscious mental events down into the physical world and identify them with the physical processes. Then they can, then they can be efficacious again. Then they can have an influence, but they're going to have an influence in so far as they're one and the same as the physical processes. Mm. Now, that's a very powerful line of argument, and it makes simple-minded dualism that there's the physical processes, and in addition, there's the conscious feelings. Uh, uh, very unattractive. Now, in fact, there's a 
I mean, I should mention, and you're going to be talking to Philip Goff and uh, other people in this business, is a kind of people who are interested in these metaphysical issues. There's a third way. It's called Rossinian monism. It leads plausibly mm -hmm. to panpsychism, which is a way of somehow simultaneously respecting the idea that conscious feelings transcend science, yet nevertheless aren't outside the physiological processes that give rise to bodily movements. And it's, it's, it's a Rossinian monism and panpsychism are, are an attempt to, to square the circle. The circle, uh, the problem being your compelling thought that the conscious feelings are something extra to what's given by science. And the worry that if so, well, then how are they efficacious? How do they have an influence in the physical world? Mm. And and Rossinian monism and panpsychism is an attempt to to make those two thoughts consistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just I just to circle back to epiphenomenalism for a second. Yeah. I, I totally agree that it would be a very it would be a very strange and disturbing kind of view of what your mind is, but what's what's logically incoherent about biting that bullet and just saying yes you know it's deeply disturbing but what if we simply are you know our conscious inner lives are just a byproduct like smoke coming from a a, a smokestack okay that's it's interesting thought so i'll tell you a bit of history so back kind of back two, three, four decades, mm -hmm. the first people pushing dualism were, were Frank Jackson with his knowledge argument, tightened up the thoughts in Nagel's what it was like to be a bat, and, and, then, and then David Chalmers. And back, I don't know, circa mid-80s, 90, they were inclined towards epiphenomenalism, all right? So it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit strange, but it seems to be perfectly coherent. But in fact, if you look at it closer and closer, it gets to be more and more horrible. And both Chomp <laughs> and Jackson are now moved right away from epiphenomenalism. And the real worry, the kind of clincher, is that if epiphenomenalism is true, and there are these extra conscious processes, that are distinct from the physical realm and have no effects in the physical world, mm -hmm. then your statements that I've got feelings now and your thoughts, at least insofar as they're realized as your kind of brain states about what's going on, they won't be caused by the fact you have these extra conscious feelings because everything you say and all the kind of brain process leading up to what you say, and indeed the brain process giving rise to your conscious thought that I've got feelings, mm. aren't themselves caused by the feelings because the feelings can't cause anything. <laughs> I mean, the Chalmers makes it very graphic. He says, look, imagine there's a zombie world, right? And there's going to be a zombie David Chalmers who's got no feelings but it's otherwise physically identical to David Chalmers. And what he'll be doing is what David Chalmers is doing, is sitting in front of a computer going on about all the conscious feelings it's got and how uh, exciting they are. And look at all these technicolor purples and reds and so on. And you can't be a physicalist. But in fact, that zombie would be saying all that in, in a world in which physicalism was true. And, and all that consciousness really would be an illusion in the zombie world. So... Uh, mm. The technical term is, is epiphenomenon is now widely thought to be self stultifying because it argues that the truth of epiphenomenalism, the truth of the existence of the extraconscious feelings, has no influence on all the people who go around saying they know there are all these extra conscious feelings. They would, according to epiphenomenalism, say that just as much, even if there weren't any conscious feelings. And that, hmm. that's widely considered to be a really unattractive feature of epiphenomenalism. Okay, okay. Yeah, I guess that that does... Yeah, it's pulling my intuition. Um, I, like I think I said at the beginning, I, I really don't know what I think on this issue, which is why I'm kind of doing a dive and talking and talking to as many people as I can. 
about this. So what I'm curious what um what you would say to sort of a variant of you you mentioned it earlier the Mary the color scientist thought experiment. Um so you know what if what if instead of red um you know the Mary not being able to see the color red we sort of, you know, numb a child from birth so that she cannot feel any sensations in her hands, uh -huh. right? Um, and this could be, you know, done however however we want to do it, severing a neural connection or, or giving a, a drug constantly. But she becomes an expert on, you know, the biology, the physics, the chemistry, the neurology of pain and of finger anatomy. And she even, you know, physically does burn her finger several times. Um, uh -huh. But because we've severed you know, the, the connection, she doesn't feel it. Um, sure it I seems... Like oh, sorry, what's that? I said, I'm not sure I like your experience. That's a bit, a bit cruel, but go on. Sure, sure. It's, it's, I mean, she would have to volunteer for this for some reason. Yeah. But, but uh, it wouldn't pass IRB for sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so she, she even, you know, undergoes, you know, physically, you know, the burning of, of her hand several times. And it seems like you know, to be a, a reductionist, you have to deny that there is anything else for her to learn knowledge wise. But it seems to me that if we did allow her to feel sensations in her hands and then she goes on to burn, you know, her hand on the stove and she f experiences, the, you know, the pain for the first time, she has learned some sort of objective, subjective knowledge, if you will, of that. Um, and I'm curious w what you think about that. So the standard line for a reductionist like me, a physicalist. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I mean, I think my position is still the orthodox position, though it doesn't get that much uh, uh, kind of news space anymore because it's kind of mm. boring. Everybody knows this, this option, people looking at different options. Uh, but the standard line is that... Uh, She can now think about the experiences she always knew about in a new way. So Mary uh, acquires a way of thinking about red experience, kind of, you know, she can now recreate an imagination. She can uh, uh, recognize it again when she sees it, when she couldn't before, she'd never had any red experiences. And, and, and your kid... Uh, never had any hand pains. They knew all about hand pains and so on, but they'd never had them. Now they had them, they can think about them as it were from the inside. The, the, the standard physicalist just said, these are two concepts for the same thing. So there's a sense in which Mary has new information. She knows that right tomatoes cause this experience when before she just knew that right tomatoes uh, caused uh, um, such and such activity in V4, mm. but but this experience and that activity in beef, they're just the same thing. So look, it's, it's, it's like, so I, I don't know that Tony Curtis and Bernie Schwartz are the same person, right? And I tell you, A, Tony Curtis is in the next room, and B, Bernie Schwartz is in the next room, right? Mm -hmm. Is the second thing an extra item of information. Do you know something that you didn't know before? I mean, a sense is, well, I mean, if you if you hadn't, you know, you're, you're perfectly competent with both both the statement, both the, both the names. You know, Tony Curtis is a star. The only shorts kid you grew up with. Now, now you you you're told Tony Curtis is in the next room. You're all excited. And and I say and and Bernie Schwartz is in the next room. Say goodness, I mean that too, right? So from your mm. point, of view, this is an extra item of information, right? So there's a sense in which you know something you didn't know before. Uh, but does that show that there's two people in the next room? Certainly not. No, no. Uh, does it show that in addition to the person you already knew to be in the room, there's another person in the room? No. So that's that's what the a posterior physicalist says about about. Uh, uh, Mary and your example. The fact that, that there's a sense in which the person gets in extra information, it's all at the level of concepts. Mm. The person uh, now knows that, can now think that burning my hand causes this sensation, when before she think that burning my hand caused this kind of nociceptive specific neural activity, yeah. and uh, 
uh, at the level of how she's thinking, these are different items of information. But in fact, the two concepts refer to the same thing. It doesn't show there's some extra process in reality over and above the one she always knew about as a scientist. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I guess because uh, because we are coming up on on the forty five minute mark. Um, you, you don't what? Look, you don't look convinced. You look worried. You look puzzled. Well, I I guess I'm still skeptical, and I you know like I said I don't know exactly what I think here. But w what about what about the case where, you know, because we know we sort of know the answer already in both my example and yours. Um, but if you kind of rewind the clock a little bit, you know, what what about before um, to go into neuroscience for a second? You know, what about before we knew. Um, which areas of the brain were responsible for sort of which, you know, roughly speaking, um, aspects of experience. So, so, you know, we can sort of see that, you know, dopamine, for instance, when it's released in, in certain areas of the brain by certain, you know, uh, mechanisms, it creates, uh, you know, the, the experience of sort of pleasure, right. And it, and it doesn't create, you know, rage or pain or, or, you know, frustration. It doesn't create any of those experiences. Um, it doesn't seem apparent to me that we could have known that to be the case just by looking at the brain with no report of the subjective experience from someone. So I don't understand maybe how we would do, you know, how the, the science of consciousness is, is really moved forward besides verification of the first person experience. And that to my eye, and I could be mistaken about this, seems to point that experiences and then their physical correlates really, you know, possibly are, I don't know ontologically if they're two separate things, but at least it, it doesn't seem like they're exactly the same. I'm not sure. I'm, I don't really know what I think about that. I, I think the, the, the orthodox, say, posterior physicalists will just say the same thing. Sure, you, you've got a kind of pre-physiological concept of a certain entity that you recognize by introspection and that's our kind of initial hold on it mm. and then scientific investigation shows us it's one and the same as certain neural activity and so look I mean the, the, the analogy isn't perfect but look I mean I can recognize gold uh, by you know, its color and it's really heavy and 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 then uh, we do the science, we discover it's uh, atomic number 79 and uh, anything with uh, uh, solid with, with atoms with that atomic number, that's going to be gold. And uh, so we start off with one concept, the kind of yellow heavy stuff, and now we have another concept made of atomic number 79 and uh, we discover the same thing. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't, doesn't show that, that there's two different things, kind of you know, observed gold and, and chemical gold. Uh, uh, it's just that we've discovered the stuff we used to recognize by observation now has this, this uh, uh, atomic nature. Mm. Is there any way, I guess, on any theory's account, whether it's yours or someone like, you know, Goff's or, or Chalmers, that we would ever, ever have any sort of empirical evidence for this or is it just a matter of logical consistency between the arguments so i say that there's empirical evidence for the identity theory in the form of that causal argument you can't be an epiphenomenalist uh consistently with recognizing uh, mm. Well, uh, you can't look. Let's let's look at let's look at the options, right? Okay. So there's there's physicalism of my kind. It's just one thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's old-fashioned Cartesian dualism. There's two things, and the mind affects the the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's epiphenomenalism. And look, maybe there's some other options we aren't mentioning because we haven't talked about them. Pansy. Sure. But but if but if you look at Cartesian 
dualism, that mm -hmm. presupposes that there's some physical events in the pineal gland movements of my body that don't have a physical cause, only have a mental cause. Mm. I take that to be knocked out by the evidence supporting modern science. Modern science has looked around at all kinds of movements of molecules in all kinds of situations, and it doesn't think there are any kind of sui generis mental forces outside electrical and chemical forces. I mean, sure. In the 50s, people figured out the, the workings of nerve cells, and at that point, people really didn't take Cartesian dualism, interactive dualism, seriously. Mm -hmm. With physicalism and epiphenomenalism. And the truth is, epiphenomenalism is a metaphysically really weird, ugly position. At that point, there isn't really an empirical argument anymore. But even in science, you eventually get left that the evidence leaves you with one nice, neat theory. And then some completely weird Rube Goldbergish theory. <laughs> At that point, the scientists opt for the simple theory. So, and I think so far, you would find that Chalmers and Philip Goff would agree with me. They don't want to be epiphenomenalists. It's just too ugly a theory. So they yeah. they explore this kind of Rossellian view, which is kind of half physicalist. Really, we haven't. Mm. Talked, you'd have to wait till you get. Dave Chalmers. But leaving that to one side, the question is, do you need to look beyond ordinary, straightforward, a posterior physicalism, the line I've been pushing here? Mm -hmm. And the truth is many people want to resist it because they feel so strongly intuitively that surely they've got a strong intuition that the conscious feeling is separate from from the physical brain. I think that that's just a feeling, an intuition. There's an interesting psychological, anthropological question. Why do people have that strong feeling of dualism? Hmm. But that seems to me a psychological question and probably can be answered. In fact, many psychologists and cultural anthropologists are curious about intuitive dualism. What's, what's the reason that so many people think in dualistic terms? And I think that's a serious a serious question. Hmm. But the fact that people think intuitively in dualistic terms, that's not yet an argument against physicalism. Hmm. It's, just sure. a, it's just a sociological phenomenon. Now, many people do think that there are arguments, a zombie argument. The zombie argument needs more premises than we've talked about here. <laughs> but I worry that the people think the zombie argument is a strong argument, and therefore we need to move beyond just simple physicalism, largely because they got the strong intuition. And intuition shouldn't carry any weight in philosophy. We need arguments. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, maybe I'll stop. I'll stop there. Uh, yeah. No, I don't, don't let yourself be jerked around by intuitions. Yes, I, I definitely agree with that. And and. You know, that's why I'm, you know, trying to talk with a wide range of people on this is because, you know, after reading, you know, some of these introductory papers, you know, by Chalmers and by Nagel, I don't want to trust my intuitions. Because um, as you pointed out, I don't think they're a, a very a good guide. Um, but, uh, David, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, before we end, please tell people where they can find out more about your work on on this. And I know you've written on a broad range of topics. So what would I recommend on this? Well, I wrote Thinking About Consciousness, but that was back in 2002. Uh, a little, little uh, book with cartoons, with, with, uh, with illustrated book, Introducing Consciousness. But I've got a new book coming out. I just got, I mean, I just sent it off to the publisher. He just told me it should be out in May. And that's uh, in this line of business. It's called The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. Mm. It's about what's really going on when we have sensory experience. So, Okay. Uh, but I, um, yeah. if people want to hear more about what I've been saying, just go to my website. There's a lot, lot, lot of material there, and there's a few papers under the heading of, of consciousness under, mm. under writings. So davidpapineau.co.uk. Excellent. And I'll leave uh, the links to all of these things in the description below for people. 
Um, I, I very much look forward to that new book. I, I want to, to read it, and, um, and I really want to continue thinking about this. Um, so thank you again for, for being one of the many voices I, uh, I want to, to speak with about this. Um, it was really informative. Not at all. Not at all. I hope it all becomes clear and you find your way to the truth. <laughs> I hope so as well. Thanks, um, yeah, thank you, David. Take care. You too. Bye. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, I definitely did, even though it may have seemed like I had a bit of a consternation or confusion um, during the episode. I think David gave me a lot to think about, um, especially if you, like myself, obviously, listened to the last episode. Um, and if you've been following you know, my other show, um, That's BS, more of a discussion-based show, but on episodes 97 and 99, we covered this topic as well. Um, and to be honest, I, I've sort of had my intuitions pulled a lot of different ways at this point. And, um, I think I really want to do sort of maybe a, a solo or maybe with one other person, just sit down and kind of go over all of the arguments put forth and evaluate all of them. Um, because to be honest, you know, this is a really complicated topic. And like David, um, said, you know, we shouldn't trust our intuitions at all. We should give no credence to them. On, on this topic especially, and I totally agree with that. So I um, I want to continue thinking about it, and I'm obviously very grateful to David um, for coming on the show and, and really, you know, kind of pushing back against some of my intuitions that I might have about this. So if you also found this episode valuable, you can support my work at patreon.com uh, forward slash Jordan Myers. You can also support me in non-monetary ways by rating the show on Apple Podcasts or sharing it on Twitter or social media. Um, you can like this video on YouTube and uh, subscribe to either the YouTube feed or your RSS feed. Uh, you can discuss anything about this on your own show and link back to it. Or you can connect me with guests or recommend topics to cover. Uh, you can get in contact with me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And of course, you know, all of this will be in the description below. And of course, as always, thank you for listening and keep struggling to escape the cave. Plato's Cave is produced by Muckraker Media. You can find out more at muckrakermedia.org.